Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Yuri Kruman about fostering trust and empowering your employees. Yuri Kruman, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Great to speak with you. Yeah, I'm super excited to have this conversation. It's always fun um, talking in the pre-interview, getting to know my guests a little bit. And we were talking a little bit about uh, where we're from. And uh, you're there in Brooklyn. I'm here in Utah. Uh, I think there's there's lots of similarities in terms of the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and how our communities are responding to uh, these challenges. Um, and really, as I you know, look over your bio and see all of your background, a tremendous opportunity to talk with you and share with listeners some of your insights. I just wanted to share Yuri's bio with everyone as we get started. Yuri Kruman is the interim CHRO, the Chief People Officer of HealthFlex HHS and CEO of HR Talent and Systems Consulting an award-winning HR consultancy. A certified SHRM SCP, he is likewise a sought-after speaker, an expert on HR, digital transformation, and employee experience. Yuri is a Forbes Coaches Council member and contributor to Forbes, Entrepreneur, Business.com, Influensive, and a number of other top platforms. He had consulted and spoken at numerous Fortune 500 and Inc. 5000 companies DC-backed startups and top universities, including uh, Ernst & Young, Google, Columbia, and the University of Pennsylvania. Likewise, appearing on network TV and on podcasts, including NBC's Tipping Point, Leadership and Loyalty Podcast, Entrepreneur on Fire, and Wharton Business Radio. In addition, his executive leadership coaching practice has impacted thousands of top executives. He is the author of What Millennials Really Want from Work and Life and the forthcoming Be Your Own Commander in Chief. Uh, I'm just, again, what an uh, awesome background. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Before we dive on into the topic for today, is there anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of background, um, kind of, you know, how you got to where you're at, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, just in the simplest terms, I'm just a dude in Brooklyn, and I've got a wife and three kids, and, you know, New York is fun when uh, there's no corona, but uh, right now, not so much, <laughs> like most places. Yeah, we're into our third wave, um, and there's definitely mm. been a spike here in Utah. Um, some people take it seriously, and some people are wearing masks, other people aren't. Um, mm. So, so it, it's frustrating. I don't know how it is in New York right now. I know you were hit very rough early on, um, and hospitals were at capacity. Right now, that's where we're at in Utah. We're at capacity. We're past capacity, and so it, it's you know, everyone's nervous about um, just being able to treat everyone who has um, health issues, whether it's coronavirus or other issues. Yeah, I mean, I think um, as much as everyone loves hating on uh, Cuomo and de Blasio, uh, especially de Blasio, but anyway, for for Cuomo, I think he did do some things right. Um, Maybe not the killing businesses part, but, you know, potato, potato, what can you do? Um, I think that we're probably in better shape than a lot of other places because we went through the worst and we kind of had to had to adjust in flight. In my particular neighborhood, um, I would say that a lot of people are still not really taking precautions. They just kind of, you know, part of it is like faith. You know, we just believe that we're supposed to get through this. If I'm supposed to go, I'm going to go anyway. If I'm not, I'm not. And uh, the other part is, well, you know, whatever, like we've we're over it that kind of that kind of attitude which i think is very harmful but it is what it is yeah <clears throat> yeah well i you know i appreciate uh uh 
your your take on it and perspective. I think all of us, uh, you know, definitely need to take it seriously. We need to um, move forward best we can despite the challenges. So, yeah. Um, well, good. So, I think you know, as we dive on in today and get started, um, I really would love to get your take. I, you know, I know with your your book on millennials and your upcoming book about being your own commander in chief. You know, you've done a lot of work around, um, you know, how to get the most out of your people, how to, to hire strategically, and both in your consulting work and in your, <clears throat> your own professional work and as interim uh, CHRO. What are some of the, the things that you've seen as the biggest uh, challenges? And I, I suppose the flip side of that is opportunities for organizations as they're looking at, um, hiring, uh, attracting and retaining top people, and then empowering them and, and getting the best out of them. So I think um, to give some context to the conversation, um, I'm coming in as an interim CHRO for fast growth companies, um, you know, across different industries. Right now, HealthFlex, that is a company in um, home health and hospice. So, you know, each industry has its particular challenges, but I would say that as um, in this case for HealthFlex, the company is, Inc. 5, 000, is an Inc. 5000 company for the last, you know, three to four years. And um, I would say that in that corner of the world, fast growth masks a lot of problems because when, you know, you're getting great revenue and your growth figures look great and maybe you're able to raise a round of money if that's your thing, you know, you, you tend to not pay attention to a lot of issues, especially around HR. HR is, we know it's a little bit of this, you know, last on first off kind of mentality. And um, there are always massive expectations and, you know, tiny budget, if any, for anything around, you know, people subjects. So when I'm coming in as the essentially first, it's not even a strategic hire because I'm not coming in as a full-time person. I've, I've done that before, but the, the first strategic uh, hire, the actual first full-time CHRO or chief people officer is usually set up to fail. And the reason is that um, essentially the expectations are, well, digitally transform us into the next century and, you know, make our people sing our praises on glass door and, and all of this, you know? So um, in practice, a lot of chief people officers are coming in, you know, maybe as the number two or three from a larger organization, and they haven't done anything very tactical for a number of years. And they're not really willing to, because why, why would I take a step back in my career? I've got reports for that, right? So um, it's, for me, I'm coming in as the bridge to that. So when, when a company, let's say, has a generalist um, or maybe, you know, a sourcer, a coordinator, um, then you don't have any room or time, especially. HR is almost always understaffed you have no room to even think about something more strategic about things like, well, what if, you know, what if we did a proper performance management system and actually did our performance reviews, not even every year, but actually maybe every quarter, or what if we asked our employees through employee engagement surveys, how they actually feel, <laughs> right? Things like that. And what happens if we coach our employees on things like career pathways, and maybe we try to up their compensation to market level. Right. So those kinds of things, um, they in, in the best case, you have a founder that gets it. They're like, OK, well, we have to keep up with the market. You know, maybe the Inc. 5000 thing doesn't have quite the same effect anymore. And we actually have to do things the right way. And, and that's that's when kind of, you know, things wake up. You have COVID, which comes and also, you know, forces HR to go to the front of the line and uh, become the de facto leader of digital transformation. So the role of HR suddenly in the last, you know, seven months has been massively bigger than anything before. And that doesn't necessarily mean budget. It just means, hey, you guys better show up and empower our people and, you know, make our systems work and communicate everything and, you know, just make make everyone okay. And, you know, we're not therapists. We're not uh Physicians, we, we, we don't have any, any magic special powers, but suddenly we're called upon to do this. So that's kind of the, the state of HR right now. And, you know, for better or worse, those that are doing it well um, are 
yes, communicating really well. They're able to listen to people, you know, to talk a lot less and to spout the kind of legalese and uh, compliance language that is customary for HR. They're, they're just listening. Are you doing okay? You know, could you use therapy? Could you use some more uh, days of, you know, daycare for your kids? Or maybe you need extra time to take care of your parents? You know, things like that. So just being I mean, I hate to I hate to use that term, but essentially being more human and, and less resource, <laughs> suddenly that's that's kind of what has come up to the surface. And those companies where HR has done their job well, that's that's really what they've turned on. They've turned on kind of the, the human element and, and just listen more. Like, how can I help you? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's great. I, and I appreciate that perspective. Um, I, I think it is absolutely a very challenging time right now uh, for businesses generally, but you know, for the HR function and people management, organizational leadership more generally, um, you know, it's, it's tough and there's a lot on everyone's plate. The good organizations right now are showing empathy towards their people. They, they recognize these are unprecedented times. They recognize there are challenges outside of anyone's control and they're doing their best to be supportive of their people. Um, but what, what we sometimes forget is that the leaders also are having to deal with all of this, right? Uh -huh. So, exactly. so they're simultaneously trying to keep a company afloat, take uh -huh. care of all of the needs of their employees, while also dealing with the vi the coronavirus and all of their personal upheavals in their life and everything that uh -huh. they're doing also. And Absolutely. that's a that's a crazy heavy load for for people to be carrying. And you articulated really well. The, the shifting um, responsibilities and role of HR. Uh, and uh -huh. I've, seen, I've seen the exact same thing in organizations I work with, um, yep. that, that they're, just, they're just so burdened. And so then the question becomes, how sustainable is that? Uh -huh. um, while companies are bootstrapping, trying to get by so they can continue to um, you know, stay afloat and, and make payroll. And so like you said, HR is understaffed, but they're expected to do more. Um, you know, I'm not sure quite what the answer is there, but I, I do know it's unsustainable in, the, in its current um, yep. arrangement. And so we do need to figure it out. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It's very difficult to say, you know, once the digital transformation is complete, you know, HR before that essentially was almost, I would say dying quite to be quite blunt uh, in the sense that a lot of functions, you know, were getting automated or outsourced. Let's say you're a small company and, you know, um, your compliance gets outsourced to just works and Hey, guess what they do your payroll. They do all the benefits enrollment. Um, if you have questions, you call just works, not, not the HR person. So what, what's left, right? Um, I'll tell you actually the, the reason that I do this work, I'm coming from an executive coaching background. That's what I love doing. I love sitting down with people, listening to their background, their story. And I, I'm able to not just read the person or help them to, you know, be more productive or, you know, maybe a better leader in whatever the case may be, but coaching, you have to really coach 
people and you have to do it in a thoughtful and meaningful way. Sometimes you can do it internally if you have the right kind of person. You have this paradigm of, you know, Wendy Rhodes from Billions. You know, I kind of joke that I'm the, I'm the Jewish Wendy Rhodes, the male version. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that will sustain HR. HR needs to say that, look, this is a lot more than just legal and compliance. This is a lot more than just, you know, the <clears throat> putting the systems together and making them work. Um, this really is about sitting down and making sure we're clear on, you know, who is this human? What are they about? What do they want to do when they grow up? And how can we help them in the two to three years or whatever that they're with us to do their best work as soon as possible? Because that's the way you set up a virtuous cycle, you know, the right aligned incentives between the company and the employee. Because traditionally, the two are seen as somehow antagonistic. And that's, that really doesn't need to be that way. And it's, it's actually a terrible way to look at, at humans. So one of the reasons actually, you know, segueing into the book that I've written, it's, it's a little bit different take on what HR is supposed to do. So if you look at um, how governments and universities and, and secondary schools have utterly failed to teach students life skills, when we're talking about how do you build a business? How do you manage your career? How do you manage your finances, right? I mean, never mind. how do you manage expectations? How do you make decisions? How do you process information, right? They're just sort of like, go nuts, you know, go to college, good luck, buddy. <laughs> you know, hopefully that 50,000 a year or whatever you're paying will help out, but no, probably it won't. You still got to go into the real world and pay your dues, right? So that paradigm is, it's incredibly harmful. And the issue is that corporations are on the receiving end of it, right? They get employees that somehow start underperforming despite their massive talents. They can't handle, you know, mental health issues, physical health issues, finance problems. They can't pay down their student debt. All of that real, you know, humanity that's hiding in the closet suddenly is out front and ain't much you can do about it, right? Now you're HR and you gotta, you gotta wrestle with it. So the, the point of my book, which is called Be Your Own Commander in Chief, is, is essentially to provide a really comprehensive, not just resource, not just you know, tools and hacks and strategies, but a, a real tangible philosophy for how you know, an employee or just any human can empower themselves to live their best life and their best professional life as well. So if you're HR, you know, instead of being afraid, like, oh my God, I'm, I don't want to help them to start a side hustle. In fact, you, know, you got to open up. You got to say, Actually, if a person has a side hustle, you know what, that's going to make them a much better and more efficient worker. And maybe I can even invest in that side hustle. Maybe I can even help them to bring that into the company and benefit all of us. Right. So that's, that's the kind of way that um, I, I think. And the book discusses four uh, conversations. So there's body, mind, uh, dealing with others, and God or the universe. And you have to make sure to have all four conversations or to make sure that your employees are having those conversations regularly or else, right? Or else you have people wash out and, and fail at work. Yeah, that's, well, that's great. And I, I absolutely agree in terms of this perspective towards kind of old school personnel management, transactional HR versus um, the more people development, um, strategic HR uh, that, that is so essential. And, and so when we talk about the uh, future of work and we talk about um, what's going to allow people uh, to excel and to maximize their potential and for organizations uh, to, to also be effective and to perform at high levels, uh, it, it requires a strategic approach. And that's the value added proposition of HR as a function for organizations. So I, I think it's um, super important for us to have that perspective. And I appreciate the, uh, the take that you provided on, on your, your book. Um, so thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the, the idea that you were just suggesting around um, empowerment of people, but not just in their professional life, but also in their personal life. Um, what, how have you seen that working in organizations where it's been successful? Um, like you, I, I've seen many organizations who they fail to recognize the, the value 
of people developing themselves outside of the workplace, or they see that as a separate sphere that they shouldn't even have any involvement in. And so like you brought up the side hustle example, um, and I've seen so many organizations that they tr not only do they not encourage it or support it in any way, but they actively discourage it. They, they try to keep their people from being involved in anything else outside of work because they have this notion that it's going to be distracting, it's going to reduce their commitment to the organization and so forth. Yeah. Um, I think you and I both understand that's ridiculous. Um, it's, a, it's quite frankly just a really stupid uh, mentality, but it's, it's a pervasive one I see all the time. So how do we help organizations get past that? How do we help them recognize the need to, to you know, develop the whole person, you know, whether, regardless of whether it's in work type stuff, outside of work stuff, because it all ends up impacting work. I mean, first of all, we've seen something very interesting in this, um, in this bizarre times, the, the paradigm of command and control and, uh, you know, paternalistic top down kind of um, thinking <clears throat> if that has not been applied with digital transformation, it just dies away. It just disappears. I mean, I, I unfortunately, I've seen that firsthand <laughs> in this crisis. In, in an organization that's not set up to think the right way, to, you know, to pay lip service, but not to, to kind of, you know, do the legwork, it doesn't work. People still have too many options. They have, in, in some ways, they have more options because, hey, now I can work for anyone across the country. I don't have to stay in your crappy company where you treat me like garbage. You know, so the new paradigm, um, if I may, it's not, it's not necessarily new for everyone. Some people have always done business this way, but more and more realize I can't really force people to stay. I can't really um, get a great read on what's actually going on without, yeah, getting vulnerable and without actually, you know, acknowledging that I'm a human too and that I have problems and I have flaws and the whole command and control thing is a giant sham. It's a terrible facade. So let's cut the crap in, in a way and, and, and just do things the right way. And that's what I've seen happening. Awesome. Awesome. And I think as, as we show, I mean, it takes a level of trust, right? The, the command control model, if you're going to let go of control, even if it's perceived control and it's a facade. <laughs> if, if leaders and organizations are going to let go of it, it requires some trust. And so developing strong trust between management and employees uh, up and down the hierarchy is so essential. And as we're trying to empower people and help develop them, of course, it benefits them, but it also benefits us because they feel invested in, they feel, mm -hmm. they feel the trust, they, they, uh, that empowerment allows them to perform at a higher level. And ultimately, that will result in better performance for the organization, which is what they want, right? Um, and so that, that's what we need to, to move towards. And I think leaders need to, to think thoughtfully about you know, their own style and how that may impact, for better or worse, the trust dynamic, um, the empowerment dynamic. And if we can let go of a little bit of control uh, and trust our people, it's not always going to work out, but it doesn't always work out anyways. And, and, uh, but, but for a lot of individuals who, who want to do their best work, they want to be there within the organization, you know, it, it's going to unlock a lot of potential. Um, yep. Yuri, so we're getting close to the end of our time together today, but I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get in contact with you uh, if they want to reach out professionally. Also, I know you have a, a book that's coming out soon. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so I just, I want to um, leave you with one other very quick thought, which I think is, is quite important for this conversation. So um, coming in as an executive coach to HR consulting, um, my approach has been, why not teach and coach lower level employees the same exact way that I do for executives, right? So the same way that I might coach a chief investment officer of a university here in New York. Why not do the same, meaning <clears throat> use uh, something that I have called a personal and professional development template um, for everybody in the company and essentially give them the benefit of free or subsidized by the company executive coaching. And guess what? Some people are naturally drawn towards that because maybe they're ambitious, maybe they, you know, they have some kind of previous experience with coaching. 
they go for that. And most other people, they're unfortunately, they act like sheep because of command and control. So I go in and I try to open people up in that way on purpose. Because once a person realizes, hey, my wings are actually much bigger than I thought and I have a lot more power than I do, you know, that kind of feeling when the person feels it because of the company, they're much more likely to feel more loyalty toward that company. They're much more likely to do better work and they're sure as hell more likely to stay around longer. So these things are very much, you know, aligned incentives, again, provided the executives get it. Um, so that's, I just wanted to leave you with that one piece. Now, in terms of um, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, my company is called HR Talent and Systems. Um, so feel free to visit hrtalentsys.com um, or just email me at yuri at hrtalentsys.com. Um, and just very briefly about my book, I mentioned uh, more or less what it's about. The premise there is not just, you know, okay, great. You're an employee. You want to do well. You know, maybe you're young or young at heart and, you know, you, you want to go far. So here's how to do it. But if you're HR or never mind HR, again, most HR is unfortunately very conservative and, and, and maybe seeing this as a threat. Like, oh, no, we're, again, we're subsidizing that side hustle. So let's say if you're a founder and you have a company, maybe it's fast growth, maybe it's not. And you, you want to empower your people in a meaningful way. You have to start the right conversations. You can't do it, you know, just magically with, you know, some kind of benefit or perk. And you can't just do it by bringing in a speaker once, right? There has to be some kind of um, comprehensive, again, not, not just set of hacks, but a philosophy, something actually which I think our times are certainly missing. So um, for me, this book is meant to start a conversation, meaning, okay, we're you know, we're all in this, but not because, you know, I say some nice words because, hey, I'm, I'm also suffering. You know, I live in a place where, you know, people, I don't know, don't wear masks. I don't feel safe. And um, I've got three kids jumping on my head and I got to take care of my parents. Uh, and I'm the CEO. And, you know, that's, that's life. How about you guys? Like, yeah, you're right. So, right. You open up the conversation. You, you go with your people and you, you, just acknowledge that, okay, we're all in this together. I'm going to do my best to clear the road for you to do your best work, to live your best life. And I'm asking you in return, please do the same. Please do your best work and be open about whatever struggles you have. And that way we might actually live up to that, you know, family culture we talk about. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Yuri. It has been a, a great time uh, talking with you. I've really enjoyed it. I hope that listeners will reach out, get connected, check out Yuri's books. Um, I, you know, challenge your your preconceived notions about what it what leadership should look like, um, and, and really have those honest conversations, both you know internally, but with with your people. Um, that will allow us to develop greater trust, stronger relationships, empower our people both inside, in and out of work, professionally and personally, and ultimately. Uh, it will it will lead to better outcomes for everyone, for you as a leader, for your people, and your organization. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. As always, I hope you stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, and I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.